The Witcher Blood Origin Episode 3, a show set before the conjunction of the spheres. Which means there's more humans on that planet than are actually watching the show. And there's more lore that went in that joke than in the series. But we pick up where we left off, with Bard being chased by Insect. She wandered off on her own because she's an idiot, and that creature's supposed to be really dangerous, and yet can't catch a tiny little girl. But as she runs back to the group, they create another portal to get back home. And I know what you're thinking. Where did that portal come from? I've watched enough Stargate SG-1 to know if you need a Stargate on one side to create a wormhole, you need a Stargate on the other side to create a wormhole. Except in this, sometimes they need a monolith to travel and other times they can just do it whenever they want out of thin air. It's very much like the magic in this show where they can basically do anything at all, no matter how powerful it is, as long as they need to. And boy, do we get a great example of that in the finale. <laughs> but either way, they run through the portal that couldn't have been created. The creature follows them through. <laughs> And he closes the portal, cutting it in half. If you watch Stargate enough to steal that idea from it, then, uh, can we just steal the rest as well? What is that thing? How do you expect them to know? You travelled to a new planet no one's ever been to before, and you're like, oh yeah, we'll definitely have a name for that thing. What is it, a cat? Dead. Okay, I gave a stupid answer, somehow you managed to make it worse. Please tell me this is our world. I don't know, why don't you just wander off to see if you can piss off any more massive creatures, that'll tell us. Over there, Zentraya. What? So not only did you travel back without a monolith, but you put more effort into the calculations to go to the correct place than you did when you were leaving. That guy works wonders under pressure. <laughs> but as they set off down the road, something strange happens. Someone seems to be throwing painted blocks of polystyrene at Dr. Death. Oh, it's her, of course it is. Why would it not be? Yes, the psychotic murderous dwarf that appeared in episode 2 for absolutely no reason whatsoever has just coincidentally appeared next to our cast. Should we come up with a reason in the plot why all these different people in their separate independent lives have their paths cross and decide to join forces against a common goal? Nah, let's just have a meet him walking along a road. Which is actually how they met Dr. Death and the other two main characters. I don't know, it's like there's some kind of pattern. But she starts waving at them for some reason in the royal manner. A dwarf. It's feeding time! Because it seems like the dwarf's trying to warn them to save them. Oh, that'll be it. It's the monsters in the air. Now, in episode two, the dwarf went through and killed every elf that she actually met throughout the entire series. But now she's met the heroes. Oh, I'm not going to change the habit of a lifetime. You spent an entire episode setting up a character only to contradict it as soon as you went into the next one. Come with me if you want to live. There was talk that they were rebooting the Terminator franchise. I don't know, maybe she's angling for the job. I was planning on watching you get eaten till Gwen said there was something special about you lot. I mean, this is episode three. To still be watching the show, there has to be something a little bit special about you. Gwen. Oh, put her down, love. You know where she's been. Largely in people's craniums from the last episode. But it turns out she knows who they are. She's heard stories about them. About how they took down a hundred people raiding a bank, or how the Bard has taken on a thousand assassins purely with her bare hands. How? I don't mean how did you take on a thousand assassins with your bare hands. I mean, how have you heard any of these stories? They came through a magic portal to instantaneously travel across the massive distances across the world, whereas news of their deeds has to actually travel by slower people. So how have the stories of them beaten them to other places. If we're gonna make a complex story, can we just make a timeline first so we don't confuse ourselves writing a script? And the Lark herself, no less. Oh, she's just so amazing. Thought you'd be shorter. She's probably standing on a box so it doesn't look as ridiculous when she's fighting people. It's not your fault. Your exploits are becoming more famous than your songs. Just because one of your songs in The Witcher took off doesn't mean you can force this one to be successful as well, you know. They say you killed a four score of Empire assassins and to kill you in an ish door with just your bare hands and teeth. Yes, and who told you that? You know, the little dwarf that lives in a cave and kills everyone she ever meets. What did you do? Get it off the Twitter trending page or something? But it's not just news of their previous deeds that has magically travelled across the world instantaneously. Is it true then? You're planning on killing the Empress? How do you know that? They only just came up with that plan between themselves at the end of the last episode, and then they instantaneously travelled here. They haven't spoken to anyone not in the group. How has somebody snitched on them in another realm? No planning about it. You have no idea who this lunatic is, and you're just giving them your top secret plan about how you're going to commit treason. At this point, the most unbelievable part of the show is that any of you have survived to this age, if this is how you treat people. But they discuss how they're going to do it, that he has a secret way into the city, but despite that, they're still gonna have to take out the monster, because it's already wiped out their entire clan, so if they attack her, she's just gonna use that against them as well. Wiped out the town of Gilfin in one go, they say. I can't help thinking that if you're trying to rule an empire, keeping a creature around that eats an entire town every day, you're not gonna have much left to rule by the end of the year, let alone further. Honestly, we've no idea how to kill it. We barely escaped a monster a tenth its size earlier. Yeah, they almost died to a creature that was nowhere near as powerful. 
That creature they'd almost died to definitely couldn't take on that one in the sky. What if we could create our own beast to fight and kill it? Then I would ask, why have you never done this before? If that's possible, it would have happened. And if it's happened, why did no king defend against it? Oh, with the heart of the creature from the gateway. You cut it in half. How do you know you've got the heart? And a very particular magic. I could become one with it. Yeah, that's their plan and relies on a heavy dose of magic can do anything, just don't think about it. Yeah, we've already heard about how that creature was a tenth of the power of the one in the sky, but for some reason, when they become that creature, suddenly they're ten times more powerful. Dunno, I just don't fancy your odds. I merged the beast's biological essence with mine to gain its strength and power. Hopefully that'll be enough to kill Balor's beast. No, because it's a tenth as powerful as the one in the sky. Weren't you listening before? Honestly, we've no idea how to kill it. We barely escaped a monster a tenth its size earlier. You can say whatever rules you want. I don't care. Once you've said them, at least stick to them. Not again. Not again. What do you mean, not again? Did we even learn what the first time was? What did you do? Merge your boyfriend with a horse or something? Just went horribly wrong. You got the top off instead of the lower. <laughs> I know. I haven't been back since Mother passed. We should never have taken you in. Oh, that's right. It's that time again. It's time for the feelings. For some reason, I'm supposed to care about the feelings of someone that doesn't exist. Whining about trauma that was brought on from events that they never showed us. Call me crazy. I just think if you want me to actually care about what a character feels, you kind of have to earn it. And I I barely know who this guy is. He's been on the screen for about 30 seconds. But at this point, I'm just glad they're whining about their feelings in a forest rather than a hallway. And if you think, oh no, he's not whining about it. Oh, he's just gonna cry about it instead. Nothing says hero of the story like breaking down in tears. I never told anyone about what happened. Whatever we brought back to life, that thing wasn't her. Basically, they're just complaining about some necromancy they did on their own mom. I mean, seriously, get over it. If she died, that's the bit you should be upset about. If you brought something back and it wasn't her, that it's not that you lost anything, at least you tried. You're supposed to care about this emotional crisis for two characters that have existed on the screen for about 20 seconds. But he continues to cry his little eyes out for a long time, and I think it's just so they can waffle on in a forest for a while to try and stop the monsters from appearing later in the episode as they're far more expensive. This is an incredibly cheap scene, so let's just try and drag it out for as long as possible. I know. I know I have no right to expect your help. Everything that's wrong is because of me. Of course it is. Oh, it's all my fault. I've destroyed the world. I'm just a horrible kind of man. And I really need you, the female sorceress, to come along and save me and correct me. If only you were in charge from the start, then none of this would have happened. Please, please, can't you just go and rule the world? Without your help, the world ends. Told you. Maybe I should just let the world end. That is one creepy expression. I wouldn't worry about that, love. Netflix did it for you when they cut your episodes down from six to four. It's not the greatest sign you get in a season two, is it? But we just cry for some more because we're adults with absolutely no sense of self-control. We jump over to the queen, and I'm not sure whether this is supposed to be artistic or not, but if anyone can explain the point of this scene, help. I just need to stay alive. Yeah, that was it. We cut over to a person who just goes, I hope I'm not dead, and that's it. I know fast cuts are done to hide that an actor can't fight, but it doesn't work to hide a terrible script. But her puppet mage is out here desperately trying to find something, and he is incredibly thorough in his search. Yeah, he actually picked up the books with detective skills like that. I'm amazed you haven't found it already. But just when he's given up and he decides to walk away, we get quite possibly the creakiest floorboard in all of existence. Oh, I guess it must be hidden under the floor. That has to be the crappiest hiding place you could have come up with. You didn't even bother to move the bed over it. Make sure it doesn't creak and cover it up. Seems like the most basic of things for any kind of hidey hole in the floor. But also, he's a mage. Put some magic on it. Because at this point, you deserve to lose your alethiometer. Your merging of elf and beast. If you can do it, it can't be you. It needs to be a warrior, not a mage. Why? That seems entirely backwards. A mage can absolutely annihilate some guy swinging around a piece of metal. And so a super mage is going to be way more powerful than a super warrior. You thought the insect was strong before? Imagine the insect casting spells. One of us. Stick to your plan and destroy the monolith. Why aren't you saying anything? No one tells them their plan is wrong or stupid. Instead, it's just like you do realize if you're doing this, you're going to die, right? Who knew turning into a massive evil insect would have had consequences? I mean, I would suggest if the fate of the world involved turning into a massive hulking warrior, then you should probably choose the big massive warrior, not the tiny little woman. But at the end of the day, it's very hard to argue against this. The transformation will be long, beyond painful. 
I guess the plan has its positives. Is there a Colosseum nearby? You could sell tickets. This is my destiny. But they need various different things in order to do the spell. I actually think this is put in because it's one of the few things that the showrunners actually know about the games. Oh, you pick herbs. They'll love that. That'll be so nostalgic. Well, also a handy excuse to get them to do feelings in hallways. This can't be you. Has to be me. Please let it be her. The more you try and force your audience to like a character, the more they're going to dislike him. So this is just a, a nice upside. There's just some people in the TV show that need to be brought down in a peg or two. Welcome to the peg. And if you think I'm being harsh, just wait until episode four. Because some child with a sickness babbles some prophecy nonsense. It was nonsense when Beast didn't exist. That is no way to talk about a dwarf. I know she's insane, deluded, and thinks a hammer's talking to her, but Beast is going a bit far, don't you think? But she says, no, it has to be me in the mists. I remember burning a family alive, so I've got to atone for something. It's like at least you're holding yourself accountable for the first time in your life. It's a shame that some mist had to guilt trip you into it, rather than just your own memories and feelings about it. But you know, it's nice that you're finally doing something rather than just going around a load of pubs getting drunk and singing. It wasn't even the worst of what I did for my clan. We've all done unspeakable things in the name of our clans. Look, I know you did the queen, but I didn't think she was that bad. Surely she gets some points for being an actual princess, even if she is a deranged lunatic who wants to take over the world. But then again, I can fix her. I thought sharing my music could fix what I did. How? Not even that good a song, and I think we've all learned if you travel the world spreading crap music, you actually end up doing more damage. Just look at the Spice Girls or Justin Bieber. But it will never be enough. Sacrificing myself is the only way. Yes, you will never be able to sing enough to make up for burning a family alive. I don't know why this has to be said. But at least her current plan has some significant upsides. No, you bring so much hope to this world. That's true. I never felt more hope for this show than when she said she was going to sacrifice herself. But he says, no, you can't do it. And suddenly we get this. Yes, in episode three, a plot line just springs out of nowhere. If in episode one and two, there was some kind of hint that they were going to get together, they actually liked each other, then maybe this could have been earned at some point, but instead, no. It's almost like we missed two episodes where they were supposed to be getting into a relationship or something. Or maybe she's just after one last roll in the hay before she gets yeeted off the plane of existence. That is also possible. But back in the cave where we've gathered the heart, looks like a weird coral reef from me from the Subnautica game, but this is what we're working with, folks. She lets everyone know that she's going to take the elixir and turn into the monster, which is weird considering she already told them she was. Look, it was 90 seconds ago. The audience might have forgotten. You know I'm probably dying tomorrow, right? So where's my... Wait, you sad bunch of horses. If we're celebrating, I'll drink to that. So then we get a really long scene where everyone's celebrating her imminent demise. I can't blame him. Awake! <laughs> yes! Yes! Oh, bless her. She's not been that happy since she found out Tom Cruise is shorter than her. Now, for some reason, she had a sort of local batisserie setup going on in her cave. I, I don't know, don't ask me. She simultaneously got a hole in the roof, so when it rains, she has to move, combined with this. Because I live in the poxy woods, don't mean I got to forsake the trappings of civilization. <laughs> That's exactly what it means. That's why you've got a hole in your roof and don't have a door. Drink with me. I hope she's trying to get him pissed. I know he won't say yes in his current state, but... If I lower his inhibitions, this is 2022. I thought that wasn't allowed. So he's like, if we're going to do this, I definitely need to be drunk off my face. I know you're going to die tomorrow, so I'm willing to lower my standards to make sure you have a good send off. But I don't want to remember it. So they play a game of cards and the little one and this one start flirting with each other. Yeah, everyone's getting off with everyone else at record speed. I know this is a fantasy world, but how is that even going to work? Are well, you going to buy a stepladder? So most of them are now sufficiently inebriated and she asked him about the future plan. Look, we need to know where the secret tunnel is. There is no secret entrance. It seems like quite a flaw in the plan of attacking a major city with a full army in it. And even if there was, I'd have found it and shut it down myself. Okay, so what was your plan to attack a city with a full army in it then? So I made the security of the city unassailable myself. Absolutely nothing can get through. By the way, me and a bard have got a plan to take it down. I can't help thinking you're not the most logical of people. We'll improvise. I have a feeling that was the tagline of the writer's room. We've written ourselves into a corner. What are we going to do? I don't know. I improvise. Just make it up when we get there. We don't need to worry about the future. It's fine. Doesn't need to make sense. We just need to write that it actually happened. Every time I think I've suffered the last fool, another lands in front of me. You can't call him a fool. You agreed to be part of this disaster as well. She gets angry that she's been lied to and storms off, remembers the massive bounty on his head and comes up with a plan. Back in the castle and she's congratulating on the fact that he stole the alethiometer. Again, it's been a few minutes in the show. You probably just forgot he did it. So we've got to remind you before this happens anyway. Thief. That might be the first time I've ever liked a half foot. But he is not happy that people have stolen his book. She tries to defend him and he just annihilates all of them. He seems pretty strong. Honestly, given how annoying her character is, wouldn't have let her leave myself. But that's exactly what happens. She grabs the book and runs out the room. Have you ever witnessed a fool turned inside out? I've not seen it, but I felt something similar when I was watching Rings of Power. But then Harfoot just starts absolutely annihilating him, smashing him into walls and beds and stuff. Ah! 
before he threatens to lob him over a wall. Unfortunately for him, she's gone to get back up, including his sister. He has a simple choice, revenge or save his sister. Don't. Ah, oh, I never knew a half what cared. The stupid thing is what happens next when the queen orders the guards to go and take him. Ten seconds ago, he was in charge and she was submissive, and now she's in charge and everything's flipped just because someone decided to grab his sister. You've been played. That's that's to be the most stupid bit of political intrigue I've seen. Your entire plan was based around I can grab his sister. If that's all it took, I don't know how he's gonna lead the kingdom in the first place. How on earth were you gonna keep the queen under control if all she had to do is grab your sister's hair? Back at the party, and those two are getting very cozy with each other, she tells the story of Gwen that it used to be her lover, and she actually used her ashes in order to make that hammer and take her revenge. Doesn't explain why she went into a bubble and just started using it on a load of innocent people after she house invaded them, but, you know, she's a nutter that talks to a hammer, what kind of level are we expecting? This is also why she really hates elves, because she blames all elves for something that a couple of them did to somebody she knew once. I think there's a word for that, beginning with R. Remind me never to cross her. And if you do, climb on a table. She can't reach. And as they're giving stories about previous partners that nobody cares about, suddenly we've got to learn about him and the mage. Oh, I went through the mists and she saw the deepest, darkest parts of me. And she didn't care. I think that says more about her than you, to be honest. And she sees all that you have done, all the evil that you've torn into the world. And somehow, somehow she sees good in you. That's because she's deluded. I can fix him. But then after he's done praising the low standards of the mage. <laughs> Yeah, the dwarf falls asleep mid-story, and quite frankly, I don't blame her. I don't know why this scene exists. It doesn't add anything. It doesn't make me care about the characters. It's a load of boring twaddle. You fall asleep during his story. I'm amazed anyone made it through yours. Promising a life that they will share. You're not going to make it happen, Witcher. I don't know why you're trying to force it. But no, we get subjected to another rendition of this again for absolutely no reason whatsoever. You've got four episodes. Do something with them. So stay with me, your lover. My heart filled with worry. Stay with me, your lover. The borders are burning. This goes on for an exceptionally long amount of time. The borders are burning and war is yearning. She missed the note and they kept it in. Auto-tune it or something, dude. But if she misses the note, don't keep it in the show. So come to me, oh lover, my heart is still burning. And he's just staring at her for about 30 seconds with the camera not going off. And he's like, oh, I can't believe she can sing. This is amazing. She definitely has to survive. We can't deprive the world of this voice. Your unborn is yearning. I don't blame you, love. It bored me to tears as well. My son. Oh, you missed the note. But we continue to get slow zooms in on his face just to tell, oh, he's really passionate about this song where she keeps missing the notes. This is important, and we want you to know it's important by the slow zoom in we're going to have on his expression. The completely and utterly blank expression on his face. This isn't an emotional scene, but we desperately, desperately want you to think it's meant to be. It was at that moment he fell in love with her because she sung in a cave. This is the whole thing about the two of them. At no point has this been earned. This never appeared at any point or was even hinted at in the first two episodes. And suddenly in episode three, we're supposed to think, oh, he fell for her so fast. It was amazing. What a love song. Stop it, you're butchering it. Yeah, that's your job. But we get another long drawn out scene that doesn't contribute to anything. Oh, we all know where this is going. She's giving him the eye. You have a true gift. You're amazing. What would the world do without a bard? So they start talking about the future. What are his plans when you survive and go off on your own? How are you going to live your life? I don't have any gifts other than disgracing myself constantly. That's what happens when you sign a contract to join their show, mate. I don't know what to tell you. I don't know whether to blame you or your agent. But they talk about the princess. He's like, no, what happened between me and her wasn't real. I'm like, yeah, that's because she's a lunatic who literally didn't care when you got expelled from the kingdom. She's then decided to wipe out the whole populations of various different worlds in the future. So, you know, all I'm saying is a bit of a red flag. Of course it wasn't real. But at that point, he makes his move. I wish we'd been born under the same star. Smooth. Write that one down. Use it in the future, lads. Oh, you can tell that worked. It's just nobody has any idea why. <laughs> so romantic, he said star. And then they decide to be the thing that goes bump in the night. It's not deserved, it's not earned, and I don't know why it's happening, but apparently we're just gonna stick it in episode three for absolutely no reason whatsoever. If you think that the story is just jumping from one thing to the next and isn't connected in any way, shape, or form, I agree. But she wakes up the next morning and he's not there. Oh, he, he ditched you in the middle of the night. That's gotta be rough. Ah! Look, I know you can pass things doing that, but if you put him in that much agony, what on earth is wrong with you? But of course, he's decided to go through the transformation because we can't have the most important person of the universe sacrifice themselves. What do you think she is? Some kind of hero? No, no, she's far too important and valuable for something like that. 
He's just a man. It's what he's for. It was supposed to be me. Unfortunately, we're just not that lucky, love. And they're like, well, we can't stop it now. We've given the first elixir. I don't know why you gave him the first elixir. Everyone had all agreed that it was going to be her that she was going to transform. And somehow, at some point, he just got all of them to agree. I know you hate me. <laughs> And they're like, yeah, yeah, we don't, we'd, we'd much prefer to make you suffer. It's quite horrific, really. So he goes through the transformation. He is really looking the worst for wear, although it only goes downhill from here. They start pouring various different potions into his mouth. <laughs> Seems to like sizzle and burn. I mean, I've not seen a reaction that bad since someone tried to make me eat Brussels sprouts. <laughs> Yeah, it was very similar to that, actually. And in contrast, we get this. It really is a bit of a jump in scene. <laughs> Daylight! <laughs> But of course, we've got to have the narrator tell us the plot because the show doesn't realize how it can. Trial of the Grasses began to take its brutal toll. Empress was about to realize her grand ambition. But we can't show you that, so we just decided to tell you it. She doesn't realize how ambitious she is, but she's going to try. Why is there an omniscient voice that keeps telling everyone how I feel at all times? Key to other worlds. That is some terrible armor, isn't it? It looks plastic. Why is she even wearing armor in the first place? She doesn't actually fight anybody. We've gone from I'm a figurehead, which is going to inspire the people to I want to look as if I'm about to crush empires from around the universe. I wouldn't think you'd deliberately try and look evil, but here we are. So the three egotistical tyrants get together with the book and say, I'm going to open a portal so that we can invade and take over a different realm. Just like the three of them, I guess. If I was going to open up a portal, I'd kind of prepare because I have no idea what's on the other side, but it could be monsters. Monsters. You even say you're trying to civilize these people. That would imply that you know that there's going to be monsters. But yeah, don't worry. I'm sure the three-man invasion force is going to be successful. <laughs> Doesn't his face just inspire confidence? Seriously, he looks like Dylan Moran from Black Books. And anyone that knows the character from Black Books, you know that's not a compliment. Because he inspires just as much confidence in me as that character. <laughs> but he decides to start doing magic by touching an invisible wall. I always find when you do sorcery, mime is a very important aspect of it. And he's desperately trying to control the pillar. Pretty sure that's not meant to happen. Don't worry, dude. Happens to a lot of guys. I mean, personally, if it was me and I was trying to use a new magical device, I would have actually practiced and nailed it before I got the Empress around to watch me do it. But maybe it's just first time nerves. This is folly. We need Balor. Wow, you really jumped to that conclusion. He tried exactly once and you're like, well, that guy's never going to be able to do it, don't we? We need the most evil Harfoot in history to do it for us. You know, the guy that we just staged a rebellion against. We should definitely bring him back in charge after one single attempt. If we can't open the gateways... You don't know if you can open the gateways or not. He's tried once. Give him a chance. Without new worlds, there is no food. Oh, you are the most black pill of people. This guy really follows the if at first you don't succeed, skydiving's not for you kind of motto. You've tried once, you've failed, and it doesn't matter. We don't need practice or improvement. Look, I failed once at this one thing. Our entire empire is lost. We just got rid of him. There's no reason to even have him back. He only failed once, love. No resist us now, but I'll convince him. Three minutes ago, you staged a rebellion against him. Then we went away. Someone drank some wine and had a party. And suddenly, he's going to lead the empire again. You're changing the plot so fast, I've got whiplash. You could have at least done a montage of the guy trying to activate the pillar and failing repeatedly. He's only done it once. He choose death over losing face. I'll take care of it. I don't want you to take care of anything. You haven't even asked your mage to try again, love. I don't think you're a very good leader. And so just like that, in about 30 seconds, we've gone from, let's open this portal and invade a world to, you can't invade a portal. We need to get back our old leader. I'll convince him. Of course, it means I won't be able to lead the empire anymore, but that's fine. Oh yeah, there was this bit. Ready your scouting party. Why did you not have your scouting party ready before? Did you know his portal was going to fail before it actually happened because you'd read the script and so realized you didn't need the actors for this scene yet. They'll be ready. Why weren't they ready before? Back with the mages and we're still undergoing the transformation because we really need to drag this out for a long time. How much longer? That's what I was thinking, love. You should go, I know what it's like to watch someone turn into a monster. So do I, love. Just look at Hollywood, pick an actor that you like from a movie, go on their Twitter feed and see them turn into a monster before your eyes. Oh, Mark Ruffalo, what would we do without you? But they carry on pouring the black goo straight into his face. There's still this weird acid bubbling and just horrible noise to it. It's... Ugh. But it does get worse because now it's time for the actual procedure. She makes all these sort of vine things appear around the heart, which dive into the heart, grow out of the heart itself. Lend me your power. I'm doing magic. This is how I do it. Oh, it's so powerful. You want to shake your hands and scream and make people think it's important. I should know it's what I do in these videos all the time. It never works. But those vines all dive back into him and they just start pumping the evil monster crap into him. <laughs> I mean, do you think she'd swipe right on him now? I'm just 
just kind of wandering. And just as soon as it started, it's over, and in a scream, he collapses. <laughs> It's okay, dude. It's very common to just fall asleep immediately after. He's gone. Oh, great. Should we do you next, then? You still need to defeat the monster. Give it another go. You're just so strong and empowered. I'm sure it'll definitely work for you. I'm so sorry. <laughs> so you should be. It was your idea. I'm not sure why she's not more angry at you. You know, throwing knives or if she really wanted to make you suffer, singing. There's a lot of crying and tears that drags on for far too long. I can only apologize for pausing on uh, a cry face. <laughs> It's not you, it's just very difficult to pull off. That is a rather remarkable vein you managed to pop out of your forehead though, isn't it? <laughs> then, just as everyone thinks he's dead, obviously, after all the crying and the wasting of time. <laughs> Never saw that one coming. Yeah, I mean, him turning into a monster was only integral to the plot. Don't worry, you definitely tricked us into thinking that wasn't gonna happen. Oh, I forgot about this scene, this one's awful. They've decided to leave during the transformation because they're normal people. I think in a few minutes I'm gonna regret calling them normal people. You lot aren't mad for taking this much pain. Elves can take a lot more than a dwarf can, that's a well-known fact. Ah, uh -huh. fact. Yeah! Time for the little bigot to come out. The ne this next scene is disgusting. The ideas contained within it is disgusting, and it is literally just a guilt trip. I don't know if we can understand the analogy, the real world analogy. We're trying to teach you a lesson. Very few shows have been this purely mask off about it to do it so bluntly and so terribly, quite frankly. The most fantasy thing about this scene is that he would actually give a crap about her opinion. Elvin fact, we've been taking punishment from the likes of you for generations. Well, you haven't though, have you? Because by definition, you weren't around in your previous generations. Suffering and pain. Oh, diddums, do you want a gold star for it? Someone you don't know and you've never met and isn't related to you in any way did something to somebody else who I don't know and I've never met and isn't related to me in any way. Oh, please, this is going to be a great story, I can tell. Never understand. Yeah, but you know, it was a long time ago, you know, it, it wasn't. Wasn't you? Yep, that is the main thrust of the argument. He never did anything to you or anyone you know or didn't know or anyone who existed before he was born. I would love for you to tell me how he affected something before he was even born. Your world is built on our bones. No, it isn't. And if it was... What's that got to do with him? I know time travel exists in this story, but unless you think he's going to travel back in time and cause it all, I'm not sure why you're complaining at him, you mad cow. Is what he should have said. Monoliths are ancients buried them to bring fertile bounty to the land. They're sacred. Elves defile them. So you have some weird belief that, as far as I can tell, isn't actually based on anything like, we just buried these crystals because I wanted a crop. And so because of your weird superstitions, you don't like the fact that the elves have dug them up. Okay, they are theirs though, not yours. No wonder famine's rife. As far as we know in this story, those crystals have literally nothing to do with the food production, and she's just waffling her own superstitions. If you want to say that, you should have proved it in some way. You can't just have her come out and say it on a log while she's guilt tripping a guy and expect us to treat it like it's science. You won't find me denying it. But we should do. We've not been given any single evidence throughout the entire story that what she said is correct at all. You really believe you can kill the Empress? Oh, we're just gonna leave that, are we? Oh yeah, I can guilt trip you for something that happened before you are even born, and you're just supposed to go, I believe you. Your feelings mean a lot to me. No, it's got nothing to do with me, love. I wasn't born. You know what Genghis Khan did? I can't believe you didn't stop Genghis Khan, even though you didn't even exist in this realm. I have fun. You should feel guilty for acts that I arbitrarily determine are your fault because it gives me power over you. Piss off. The only excuse for this scene is we already know she's a delusional lunatic, and so nobody should be listening to her because she's off a tree, which was just proven in this scene. But suddenly they realize the Blade Master is no longer there, which considering she left in the middle of the night and they've done the entire transformation, no one went, where is she? Which is a little bit coincidental that she's only just arriving at the town now. The town which is invisible range. Yeah, she's been traveling all night on a horse to travel maybe half a mile. Also, don't know where she got the horse from, but the city guard ran out to meet her. It's not the strongest of defenses, is it really? There has to be easier ways to greet single people coming into your city. People will be doing it all the time on a major hub. For whatever, I don't know why I'm trying to make sense of this show. She shows them that he's actually a bounty and so I've got information. I have information for your empress. The information is that she's a deranged bitch. So they ride back in and we cut to the castle because we don't want to show you inside the city. That CGI is expensive. She gets a huge eyeful at the monster. Now at this point, the Blade Master is being brought in front of the Empress, and for some reason, despite the fact she's got two guards flanking her, still has a sword. She's also Ghost Clan, which got poisoned 
by the Empress's clan, and so has an axe to grind. But nobody wanted to take the axe off her. Okay. Yeah, there's four guards there. She definitely can't handle those people. What is it, Empress? Do you think that new armor's gonna protect you from the plastic? She's even holding her sword as she's walking along. She got another dagger there. If she had a throwing knife on her, this would all be over before those two could even move. Maybe that's why they didn't take the weapons off her, because even if you did, there's just a load of swords lying next to you for assassins to use in any attempt. Even if you disarm people, they could just rearm themselves off this anyway. I know you exiled your security guy, but this is taking the piss. Are she even looking at it? Like, there's the sword I want. Think of the damage that I could do with it. Your markings. Ghost tape. She knows she's Ghost Tribe. She knows that Ghost Tribe wants to wipe them out. Why are we not concerned about the swords? I thought you were. I am the last of us. Don't mention the last of us to me. That's coming up soon and it's going to be hell enough already. We don't need to think about it now, love. This is enough, believe me. Were it another time? I would have killed you by now. You certainly would, because nobody took your swords away. And at that moment, this guard behind us starts gripping his sword as if, oh yeah, we actually forgot about that. She's now threatening the Empress and I didn't even pat her down. I just get the impression that a stranger coming into your city to see the Empress should go through higher security protocols than entering a nightclub. Do you even check her bag for powder or anything? Wait. A little like, wait, and some people grab the swords, and this guy, he does not care at all, does he? Even if she charged the Empress, this guy wouldn't move at all. The other guy is standing to attention and ready. This one, I'm just here to collect my pay until retirement. I've got a nice, cushy gig, standing in the throne room, guarding a chair. I don't want to fight anyone. You would have tried. No, she would have succeeded. I mean, there's four people, and she's got a sword. Who's going to stop her? You are a complete moron. Yeah, the closer you get to her, the easier it is. At this point, she could definitely reach you before they even reacted. And no, because I could reach you before they could react. I know where Fial Stoneheart is. Yeah, she's turned traitor. She's grassing up everybody. All because there wasn't a secret tunnel into the city, which does make sense because you have no other way into the city. I don't know how he's going to improvise. He's alive. Did you have any reason to think he was dead? How come the dwarf has all these stories about a managed to escape robbing a bank and all this kind of stuff? And she's like, I don't even know if he's living. You can't simultaneously have instant communication internet where stories travel ahead of the people that actually made them and then have a not know what reality is. Uh, you know, pick one. Last I left him. Yes. That's true. He did briefly die after you left him. <laughs> and now you're willing to betray her. You betrayed some family of your own, I believe. Is that really a good response? What, you're willing to betray your own family? Well, you're a cow as well. It's not the best negotiation strategy, is it? Look, we're all filth. Now pay me. But she negotiates prices for the two of them, 20,000 for the lock and 50,000 for her toy boy, as well as getting a sword back. I require 50 of your Golden Empire soldiers to help bring him in alive. Yeah, because if you really want someone alive, the thing you should do is send people holding swords after them. I don't know, I just get the feeling that he won't exactly go willingly, and then I'm not sure what you're supposed to do after that. Either way, that's their plan, even though it doesn't make any sense, and so they carry it out. Make it so. Calm down, Jean-Luc Picard. Back in the cave and he's terrified. I want to destroy everything. After watching this show, dude, I can sympathize. But no, she manages to calm him down. I can hold hands. I know you're possessed by a creature of evil, but have you ever considered the power of love? All right, love, you might be impressed by your chest, but I'm not sure it can control demons. I'm sorry. Of course you are. You're a bloke and this is Netflix. I wouldn't expect you to be anything else. I thought you were gone. Couldn't bear it. But oh yeah, this is definitely a deep relationship, which I'm sure you all feel such immense emotion for. I mean, it didn't exist 20 minutes ago, but don't you know, these two people are star-crossed lovers from the edge of eternity. Definitely didn't come out of nowhere, suddenly get injected into episode three, all because we needed some cheap way to try and access your fifis. But obviously he's been possessed by an evil demon that wants to destroy the entire universe. How could she possibly resist that? What can I say? She loves a bad boy. At the end of the day, what is a lethal white caterpillar between friends? This scene goes on for way longer than it was required to, and then at the end, he loses control. I mean, that can be pretty normal for blokes, but generally, they don't turn into a demon afterwards. Ah, oh, I don't know if I can control myself. Please, you've got to control yourself. You already did. <laughs> Back with the half foot in the cell that he made for the other wizard, which is such a great prison, that that sorcerer actually escaped, and we still have no idea how. It does make me wonder why you don't just escape the same way, though. His sister's signing at him. I'm not turning the subtitles on. This is a visual audio medium. Talk to me. <laughs> Yeah. And he starts talking about true sacrifice comes from within. I just realized what that meant too late. His half foot is slipping. You do wonder why would this evil guy have sacrificed his entire empire just because someone's got a knife at her throat? Like she's not even his real sister. Turns out, oh yeah, you're actually the key to my power. I had to simultaneously care about you and not care about you at the same time 
so that the sacrifice of me caring about you was valuable enough to give me the power, which simultaneously proved that I didn't actually care that much about you in the first place. What can I say? Just because it's a cliche doesn't mean it actually makes sense. Now I realise what she meant. Too late. Yeah, she means you, love. You're just too thick to realise it, even when he actually told you. But the Empress comes in to convince him to join her, despite the fact that five seconds ago she led a rebellion against him. We need to talk. Okay, but wasn't that obvious when you walked in the cell? What else do you think he thought you were gonna do? There's no need for this. You're the one doing it! You literally locked him up in prison, then went to the prison and went, I don't know why you're in here, love. Have you considered just not being in prison? But he says I was the one that built this cell to trap other people, and now it's made me powerless. But there is a way to be free. Serve your empress. It's still stupid that she's leading the Empire. He staged an entire coup to take over the entire realm. He definitely would have had everyone loyal to him, but for some reason, oh no, someone's grabbed my sister and it's all over. It's the most basic and fragile of plots that you could have made for this. No wonder he's smirking at you. Your little shadow couldn't open the gateway, could he? Well, that's true, but to be fair, they only allowed him to try once. Maybe he'll get better over time. But she's like, no, we need you. So if you join me, work for me, open up the gates, then together we can lead into the future. I'll give you a title, I'll let you back in your old position, I just need your loyalty. And reinstate your title, Chief Sage of the Council. I helped you once. No, you didn't. Look where it got me. What? What do you mean where it got you? You didn't help her. How can this show forget its own plot? No, you didn't help her. What you did was manipulate her so that she helped you lead a coup, which you then used to control her, and in your own words, just put her up as a pretty thing for people to look at. But you were the one in charge. You made her think that you were helping her, when actually, you were just getting her to go along with your plan. So please, pray tell, if you actually remember the story of your own episode, what on earth does this mean? I helped you once. Look where it got me. How do you not even know the lore of a three episode show? I could understand if this had gone on for six series, you had a really complex thing that you occasionally get things wrong. Three episodes, dude, he's not asking much. Oh, we began this at odds. See, she remembers your plot, so how come he forgot his own actions earlier? How do you have two different characters talking to each other about two different sets of events when only one of them actually occurred? Just makes them come across as stupid. Which is a problem when they're both the tyrants which are meant to be leading an empire into the future. But look at what we have already achieved together. I mean, what? Apart from your eye makeup, what have you actually achieved, love? You kill- you wiped- you wiped out all of the leaders of the clans, and then for some reason they all decided to join you even though I have no idea why. Somehow you managed to get all the war-hungry generals to make peace to stop a peace so they could have a peace afterwards, even though at the end of it they just wanted war. Maybe if you spent more time on logical analysis rather than painting your own face, you might understand what's going on. Thanks to me and my vision. Yes, and I am grateful for it. <laughs> All she's done is taken other people's ideas, other people's power, and she's like, I'm an empress now. Yes, because you spent your entire life doing absolutely nothing, sitting in your own bedroom reading books, and suddenly like, I can rule the universe. I mean, the only thing at this point that could make her worse is if a certain bard came along and said, you know what, love? You were right. Oh, the foreshadowing. Why do we find ourselves so far apart? It's a matter of respect. All about respect, in it, bruv. You just don't like me because I'm working class and you're the elite, and I've got to lead a class revolution against the elite. Oh, it's horrible. You see me as a princess to be kept on a leash until the time comes to trade me, use me, or get rid of me. I mean, that is pretty based off him, I've got to admit. I think he's pretty much covered all the bases there. And you see me as a lowborn, raised far above his station. This is how you see yourself. Okay, but I have a question. Why should anybody care? All that matters is his actions and his future plan and his motivation for doing so, and Oh, but I was born a peasant isn't motivation. Not unless you're actually trying to whip up a story about class revolution anyway, in which case, we have to sit through this pain and suffering. I see you as a singular genius. That's because you haven't met many people. You've spent too much time around books. Due to that, you're just impressed by the fact that he can talk back to you. Capable of so much more than the box my father put you in. I only ask that you see me the same. But that would mean you were the same, and you'd have to be worthy of being the same. Which means you've just called yourself a singular genius. There'd have to be some kind of reality to back that up, and there isn't. And I can prove that, just in fact that I've watched the show. Tell me one thing that you have ever done in this show which even proves you even mildly intelligent, let alone a singular genius. You've bumbled from pillar to post accidentally doing things, and the things you have achieved don't actually make any sense if you think about it. But he agrees to help her because quite frankly he doesn't want to be in the cell, and he also makes him helping her contingent on his sister's release so she doesn't have to stay in the cell either. Back at the camp, they're talking about Blademaster, who just ran off and ditched them. This is a lost cause, we don't have a secret tunnel in there. She just saw 
swore that we're all going to die and ran off. Probably the best plan she could have got with barring not actually taking the money to act in the show in the first place. Run away, get out at the end of episode three, job done. Turns out there's no secret entrance into the palace after all. Yeah, you probably should have told them that earlier, you know. Before you turned one of them into a massive monster creature thing that's gonna kill everybody. Work out if you can actually do the plan before you do the most significant part of it with no going back. And when Fial told- The mages didn't even know when they turned him into that thing, that there actually was no way they could properly use him. But at that moment, she comes back on a horse. I don't know where they got the horses from. Where did the other horse come from? They came through the monolith. They didn't have horses. Where did the horses come from? Did the dwarf have two of them? And if they are hers, why isn't there some kind of climbing frame for her to get on top of him in the first place? But she tells them a story about how we need to go down this hunter's track. I found a way into the city. It'll give us cover on the way in, and whatever you do, certainly don't speak to the guy who actually led security for the city. Don't speak to him about it. Don't ask him any questions about my plan. Don't get him to give feedback on what he thinks would be the best course of action. He only led the security of the entire city. It's not as if he has anything to say about it. Not as if he has anything to add. Smart. You're amazing. You look the same. Did it not work? To be fair, if it didn't work, she'd be lying flat on her back right now. Which, admittedly, she's already done twice this episode, so I guess it's just a matter of timing. But at that point, he appears, doing his best, I'm really angry face. The Fjord who emerged from that cave was not the same as the one who had entered. Thanks for telling me, love, because otherwise I couldn't have possibly gathered myself. I've always wanted a narrator to spell out very obvious things just in case you were too thick to realize it on the way there. It's a 50 minute show, but you think I've forgotten things that happened five minutes ago. The energy that shifted in the air around him was like nothing any of them. There's no energy in the air around him. You could actually have done that with CGI and had something like radiating off him if you really wanted to. What even was that meant to be? Oh, I think he's turned into a creature. How should I test it? Lob a dagger at his face. Powers from some kind of weird white monster creature. You had no reason to think he could even stop a dagger flying to his face. What would you plan if he couldn't catch a dagger in the air? He'd just fall over and die. What would you plan if stopping a dagger flying at his face wasn't actually one of the new powers he'd just inherited? Oh, but just do it again. We need another heart, though. <laughs> he got his powers from a caterpillar. You don't know whether that could have stopped a dagger either. Not bad. Yeah, but what if it had been? What if it'd just been average? What if someone wanted to test your talent and lobbed a dagger at your face as well? It's how you know, wonder someone wiped out your clan if that's how you treat people. But they go off following the Blade Master's plan. She leads them through a sort of rocky pass. Unfortunately, it's a dead end. There's an issue with this, though. The hunters track to Centraeus, just over the next ridge. Yeah, you know who should know about that? The guy holding the big axe. Like, oh! You've led us into a dead end. Yes, and he knows this area because he was brought up in this area and he was head of security of the city which you're heading towards. And you're like, oh, I never knew this part of the map. I'd just never been here before. You're literally telling him about a path into the city which gives you cover and he's not supposed to know it exists. You can't simultaneously say that he knows every single possible secret path into the city and then find one and he's just like, oh, I didn't know. Oh, I'd just never been here. He can't be a genius that knows every route into the city and an incredible thick person that's never looked at a map before at the same time. Oh, I just didn't know this was a dead end, despite the fact it's been like this for centuries. This isn't like a tree fell over on the road or something. It was not a new change. This is part of fixed geography. <laughs> but at that moment, they find out they've been betrayed. The 50 guards that she brought with us now block the exit. <laughs> That's an excellent question. Where could they have come from? Considering you just walked in there and they were right behind you, which means they were following right behind you and none of you heard them. Don't know, it's almost like they appeared out of thin air when you cut the camera, wasn't it? But they decide to fight, largely because they don't have any other choice. Blade Master rides off as if she's going to attack them, only to join their side and they find out they've been betrayed. But as she leads them into the path, archers appear on top of the mountains and absolutely annihilate all of the guards. We get a few little fight scenes and find out why she's named her hammer. Take out his knees because that's the only place you can reach. That was a work of art. Oh, that is Dylan Moran from Black Books. Seriously, not getting him to play the Major's dad, you have missed a trick. Turns out this was all part of a plan. She went away to get the $70,000 so that she could get the cell sword so that they could come, betray the guards, after killing the guards, take the guards' uniforms and get into the city. There's a problem though, because of course there is. You didn't expect him to actually think through the plan first. Why would the Empress Give her the 70,000 gold up front. I've negotiated 70,000 gold for the capture of these two people as a bounty. You would never give her that cash. That would be insane. And without that, everything falls apart because she doesn't have the cell source to do the mission. Never doubt my plan again. Your plan sucks and it doesn't make any sense though, love. Did we just win? I don't know. You are supposed to be a mage. I kind of thought two mages together should be able to take out 50 guys. You can turn a man into a magical creature from another realm, open up portals to different universes, but you can't defeat 50 men waving sticks of metal. Curious how that works, isn't it? Sorry, Gwen. 
gets a wee bit jealous, see? So glad we got the complete lunatic of the group to lecture the elf on morality. You really drove home that message with this one, I tell you. Little philosopher her. But they dress up in the armor. She doesn't bother to hide her hair or anything. Why would I try and disguise myself inside a disguise? It's not as if the city guards know who went out or who the people we're capturing are supposed to look like or anything. Why? Why would they know that? She's certainly not easily identifiable at a distance with that hair either, is she? Every blade on the continent is hunting you for the reward. And so she might want to disguise herself if people shouldn't know who she is. In her disguise, which is a suit of armor that looks about 15 sizes too big for her. Now the seven had the blades they needed behind them. They stood a fighting chance. Thank you, narrator, for spelling out the bleeding obvious. I mean, they still don't because there's 50 of them against an entire city. But I do think most people could have worked that out from the scene which you've literally just shown us. You don't have to tell us what we watched 30 seconds ago. If they could get Fjol inside before the beast inside him took over completely. Yeah, I'm sure there's going to be absolutely no problems getting into the city, considering they all look such like the town guards that left in the first place. I can't remember any problems with what we're about to watch at all. They discuss their plan about how they're going to break into the city, open up the grain stores because everyone is starving, and so when they get food, they'll be more than willing to actually rebel against the evil elite. This is a working class rebellion, a working class revolution from the ground up, comrades. Yes, they are making it that obvious. I don't know if you can spot the problem with this picture. One of these guards does not look like the others, which means they stand out, which means people will pay attention to you, especially when you've only got one prisoner, even though there's supposed to be two prisoners, and you look like the other prisoner that's supposed to exist. Why are you in uniform? Why are you looking like a guard? Why didn't you just capture her as well and bring her along at the front? Is it because you couldn't show someone of her stature in chains? Bit too close to the non-PC bone, was it for you? <laughs> now you're just taking the piss. You're not just taking the piss, you're recycling it so you can take it all over again. Yes, you love don't you think someone would notice? Don't you think that someone would remember a dwarf soldier in the guard and that one didn't actually leave in the original guard, but for some reason has come back? And if there wasn't one in the original guard, how did you get a uniform that basically fits you? How does the helmet fit you? I know this is a fantasy realm, but suspension of disbelief, it does have some kind of limit, folks. Come on. This isn't gonna work. No, it wouldn't work. It's stupid. Look at the picture in front of you. Of course it's not going to work. They would definitely know who you are. And they would at least shout out, Hey, hey, what's wrong with that one at the back? She seems a lot shorter than the rest of you. Oh yeah, and for some reason you've got a blonde woman among you just at the back, despite the fact that only men went out in the first one. No one can remember who went out there, no, no. Well, yeah, we've got a huge wide mix. I'm so glad this city is really up on its equal opportunities for the metal-wielding lunatics. But he starts losing control, and so she does the only thing that she's ever been able to do her entire life. Yeah, I'm sure humming in his ear is gonna do something about it. Unfortunately for the story and me and my sanity, it does. Carry my voice with you. After how long I spent reviewing these episodes, unfortunately, love, I don't think I've got any choice. It's amazing how when you've got four episodes condensed down to six, you end up with two major problems. The first are that all the scenes don't seem to be tied together. It's a load of unlinked actions that lead on to the next bit, rather than a sort of cohesive story where everything naturally flows. And things just came out of nowhere. They had a whole relationship that was incredibly important to this episode and the next episode that came out of nowhere. It wasn't in episode one or two at all. We've got a dwarf lecturing an elf on things that other elves did before he's even born. He's like, well, I'm not going to argue with you. Surely you can't be saying that you didn't do something as an excuse. Actually, yes, it's, a, it's an amazing excuse, actually. I didn't do it. I'm going to be held accountable for my own actions, not for somebody else's. This entire show seems more like a vehicle, a vessel, in order to try and get their themes, their virtues, their morality across to everyone else. Despite the fact that to everyone else from the outside, it just comes across as pure evil. And I say that intentionally because I've seen episode four and what happens in episode four, the evil that comes across, the absolute horror that our heroes do that are supposed to be the good guys. Oh, if you think this show can't get worse, believe me, in the finale, it certainly does. But I'll have to leave that for the next video. For now, that's it from me. If you liked the video, press like, subscribe. More videos like this in the future and I will see you in the next one. Bye-bye.